hi fam and welcome back to my channel my name is vuvu if you are new on here please consider pressing that red subscribe button down below and joining the family if you are an oldie a member of the family welcome my fam and thank you for joining me once again and as you can tell today i'm doing another first chapter friday of this much anticipated read called goddess crown by Sade lapite this is a debut and the first book to a series i don't know how we mm, okay it's not a standalone it's the first book to a series and it's a debut so if you're curious as to how this first chapter goes please do stay tuned so bubavena on the score reads is an amazing book reviewer also youtuber she reviews books on youtube and if i'm not mistaken she also has a blog as well so please if for your connection with literature get in touch with or follow at v-u-v-u-v-e-n-a underscore reads she is based in south africa and i think it is also extremely important to follow literary content creators who are based outside of who are based outside of the west and in continental africa because they do a really good job of bridging the gap we appreciate you Vuvu, for bringing us turning pages and for bringing us your booktube channel you know this is a chance for people to actually see some people that I really enjoy. Please consider pressing the red subscribe button down below. And if you are returning, welcome back, fam. Vuvu, you are amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, absolutely. Love this cover. I mean, whenever you see black people on the cover, just be sure that I'm in love with it. But look at this. Look at the jailer. Look at the crown. Well, I don't even know if... The, yes, the jailer with the crown at the back. Look at... The exudance of wealth and riches, of gold, of beauty, of ooh, and the melanin it's serving. I mean, it's a simple cover, but it is a striking cover. It is gorgeous, gorgeous. Ten out of ten, ten out of ten for the cover. Okay, okay. Um, Danielle Clayton says, opulent beauty, opulence, beauty, and danger. Ha! Then the catchphrase says, girl, rebel, queen. Please say less. I love me a strong black female lead in fantasies, okay? I like to see them showing down at the final battle, doing the things that are meant to be done for justice. It's always for justice, you know? Anyway, the synopsis reads, Kalothea, Kalothea has been raised in hiding, safe from the reaches of the king, until the day the assassins strike. Soon she is thrust into Gala's royal court, a glamorous and treacherous world dominated by powerful men. With enemies on all sides, the only man she can trust is her bodyguard to survive the court and avenge those she loves. Kalothea must claim the power she was born to wield. Say less. Say less than that. Okay, chia. So this copy was sent to me by Pan Macmillan, South Africa, for review purposes. And listen, when I got this copy, my day was made. Made. Made, made, made. Okay. So chapter one. Okay, it looks like chapter one is broken into a few parts. It is all off about 10 pages long. Remember that anything longer than that, we try and cut somewhere because we're not trying to read the whole book. Chat. We're just trying to give you a taste, you understand? So the first chapter is called The Forest. The sun wouldn't set for another few hours, but evening came quickly in the forest and auntie had made Kolathea promised to be back at a decent time so they could enjoy her age day meal. This last one and I'm done here, she promised silently. The scent of loomy earth filled her nose and the warm air bathed her skin. It had been a beautiful day, as though the forest knew she would be leaving in a few hours and had put on a show to wish her well. She braced her feet, sighted her arrow, pulled the rawhide string back and released. The 
arrow sliced through the air. The hare killed over, dead, before it knew it had been hit. Golathea strode over to the body, whispered a prayer to the goddess, thanking her for the blessing, then added the hare to a hunting bag that already contained two squirrels and a, and a gross. She, her, ver, her vervet monkey, yeah, yeah, swung down from a tree branch and landed in his favorite spot on her shoulder. She'd rescued him after his mother was killed by a snake when she was only a few days old. Under her doting care, he'd matured into a mischievous creature who never listened and never left her side. Are you done? Claret called from her pitch on a boulder. She clapped at a mosquito and sighed. I am. It, conf it comforted Colithia to know that she'd be leaving auntie and teacher with a full stocked provision room. Though auntie clicked her tongue and grumbled about the unseemliness of Colithia hunting, they all knew there'd be a little meat on the table if she didn't. There'd be little meat on the table if she didn't. Teacher was unskilled at anything beyond his books and auntie's simple traps only caught her of the smallest forest animals. Colithia was glad to use her weapons training to supplement their meals. Gades knew she'd never had to use the training to fight off intruders. She knew she was worrying unnecessarily. Claret could also hunt when she was done, when she was gone. In their practice compensations, her bodyguard wielded her cudgel with lethal precision. Colithia had not had no doubt the woman could provide game for the table. Except there'd be no reason for Claret to remain in the forest once Colithia was gone, she reminded herself. Claret would rejoin her army unit wherever they were stationed and probably breathe a sigh of relief that her unusual three months tour of duty protecting a minor royal in the middle of a strange forest were finally over. This, this way, Colithia called to Claret, deciding on a shorter route back to the house. Claret grunted unhappily, but followed. When she'd been younger, Colithia had enjoyed teasing her bodyguards by choosing the most difficult routes whenever she was un allowed out of the house. She knew every log, every bush, every beehive, every aclove. It was impossible for her to get lost. The delight of that had waned eventually. She'd grown tired of the forest she'd been forbidden to leave and that she was not allowed to traverse, tra traverse without an escort. She longed to visit the towns and villages she knew were nearby, but they were off limits. Only if you are attacked and then you run and don't look back. Nahir had made her repeat the rule so many times. Sixteen harvests had and they'd never been attacked. Sometimes a brave outsider would venture into the forest, shaking and fearful, braced to encounter the dead souls that were said to live there. Most of the time it was just her, auntie, teacher, her bodyguard, and Nahir on his occasional visits. Nahir. Thinking of Nahir made her kick mindlessly at a tuft of grass and sigh. Would she see him before she left? He never forgot her age day, but there'd been so much trouble on the eastern border recently, he might be unable to leave. It was better this way. She kicked at another cluster of grass. If he came, he'd ask probing questions and look at her with those eyes that saw too much. Claret would tell him about the strange hunters who'd ventured so much deeper into the forest than usual, a moon ago and Nahir would start making paranoid sweeps of the forest and putting her thoughts and putting her through fighting drills. He took his job as head of her security under his father, Lord Godmain, painfully seriously. It was actually ridiculous and she'd told him many times he was only three harvests older than her. She could still remember the lanky boy of 13 harvests 
Hood accompanied the series of stern-faced army men sent to manage her rotation of bodyguards. He tried to imitate his unsmiling seniors, but she could see his pleasure when they'd gone fishing and she demonstrated how to spear fish in the lake or when they'd laid hog traps and caught one of the of the fat fierce creatures nahir had changed when he had passed the combat test and become a captain at 17. by the time he was made head of her security he had become quiet and sober with the weight of responsibility she found she couldn't read him the way she she once had his world was so much bigger than hers and his concern so his concerns so numerous she missed the boy he'd been and felt victorious whenever she managed to tease him out but the last thing she needed on his, on this age day was nahir sniffing around seeing far too much you should be happy on your age day colithia jumped at the sound of claret's voice the woman really started a conversation colithia looked back at her You've been quiet today, Claret observed. I can listen if you want to talk. I've reached 16 harvests. I'm supposed to be reflective at, at such a milestone. Claret granted again. Colithia summoned up a smile. She did not want to trigger, to trigger Claret's concern. Colithia began prattling about how they were running low on salt and how she hoped Nahir would bring some if he managed to to make her age day celebration so they could preserve the game she'd caught. She kept the steady stream of words flowing until they reached the compound gates. The gate was overgrown with vegetation, impossible to find unless you knew where to look. She stepped aside so Claret could first could enter first, waited the mandatory minutes while Claret did her checks, then followed her inside. The sandy ground was bathed in gold and reds. The evening sun streamed down into the clearing. The house stood at a one end. Uh, at one end, a cluster of connected circular rooms made from red, sun baked mud bricks and covered with thatched roofing. A vegetable patch sprouted cheerily, cheerily beside it, and before it, a long, rough hewn wooden table had been set with goblets and bowls covered with squares of fabric. Teacher wandered out of the hen house, a handful of eggs balanced precariously in his hands he was a small dark-skinned man with a shock of white hair he always forgot to comb and large spectacles he stood in the compound and looked around as though he'd forgotten where he was heading then catching sight of them he smiled and called welcome back how was your hunt colithia smiled in answer and ran to join him so they could stroll inside together Two squirrels, a grouse, and a hare, she boasted. Excellent work, teacher reached for the front door, jiggling the eggs dangerously, alarmed Colithia door forward to open it for him. Certain auntie would kill him if he dropped them. Inside the house, the air was rich with spices, but there was no sign of auntie. Colithia breathed a sigh of relief. If she bathed and dressed quickly, auntie might not mention her late return she dumped the bag of game on the parlor room table and hurried for her, for the door i said be back at a decent time colithia jumped at the crack of auntie's voice she winced turning back slowly auntie stood in the doorway to the provision room dressed in a yellow kaftan with matching headscarf one hand fisted in her at her on her hip colithia took her in the small round-faced woman who's, who had fed, scolded, hugged and cared for her since her birth. The, the fist on her hip signaled swift action was required. She shot Auntie a sweet smile. I'm just wondering if I had to pour all my love for you into bottles, how many would I need? I don't think they'd be enough. Teacher grinned. Auntie chuckled, then tried to hide it, remembering she was annoyed with her ch with with her charge. But 
the smile hovered stubbornly at the corners of her mouth your mouth is sweeter than sugar cane your mother was the she cut herself off but it was too late the playful mood dissipated colithia often thought there was nothing auntie and teacher would deny her after all they'd moved to the middle of the Faladi forest to care for her quite a change from the royal court where they'd lived before there was nothing they would refuse her except the truth about where her parents were. Silence sang through the room until teacher nodded towards the corridor. Harry and wash up. The eggs sh shifted in his precarious hold. Hey, la, auntie cried. Put my eggs down immediately. Yeye -ye cried with delight and leaped off Colithia's shoulders to shoulder to closely observe the endangered eggs colithia smiled at teacher and rushed off to bathe that's like an interlude i think that's where i'll stop there's an interlude right there that's where i'll stop because my battery is flickering and i don't know how much time it will give me but that is in essence the first part of the first chapter of goddess crown for me yes definitely it's giving ya it's also giving me adventure it's also giving me a little bit of rebellion because clearly she has something planned that her elders don't know she has planned before the battery dies though i want to um what's this share a bit about shade la, la, la Bite. It says she spent a significant slice of her life, of her childhood nestled in the library, inhaling books by Diane Wayne Jones, Tamora Pierce, Louis Duncan, and Mildred D. Taylor. Her love of the arts led her to a degree in media arts at Royal Hollow University of London. Goddess Crown is Shade's first novel, and the world of Gala draws on the British Nigerian heritage. Shade lives in Toronto and juggles writing with a career in digital marketing. Her blog, Coffee Bookshelves, celebrates writing and promotes titles by authors of color. You can find Shade fangirling over Korean dramas on Twitter or sharing her favorite books on Instagram on instagram and that brings us to the end of this first chapter friday and if you made it this far please drop me an emoji with a, a melanin queen you know the one with the girl in the crown please drop that otherwise let me know as well if this is one that is in your radar until next time thank you so very much for choosing me bye now